You remember the story about Chicken Little, or Chicken, chicken Lickin, sometimes it's called? There's a chicken who's scratching in the ground and an acorn falls on her head, must have been just about this time of year, and she, surprised and startled, says, oh my gosh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, I have to go tell the king. And she tells all the other animals in the barnyard, all the other birds at least, she tells uh, Cocky Locky, she tells Goosey Lucy, she tells Turkey Lurkey, and Ducky Lucky, and they all say, oh no, we must go tell the king, the sky is falling. And so they run and run towards where they think the king lives and are met up by Foxy Loxy. Foxy Loxy says, oh, I know a shortcut to the king's palace. Why don't you come with me? And Foxy Loxy takes them to a dark hole, which is really the entrance to his burrow, his lair. But he doesn't tell them that. He just says, this is the shortcut to the palace. And so, one by one, they go in, Turkey Lurkey first, and then Lurkey, Goosey Lucy, Ducky Lucky, Cocky Lucky, and it depends on which version you think. I think that in Walt Disney's version, Chicken Little doesn't go in, but in the original story, they all go in one by one, and guess what? They end up as dinner for Foxy Loxy and Foxy Loxy's family. Well, the second, uh, the gospel reading today reminds me a little bit of the Chicken Little story because Jesus starts out by saying something that's very alarming to the disciples. He's told them once before, and now he tells them again, trying to prepare them for the future. He says to them, when I get to Jerusalem, I'll be betrayed into human hands, and I will suffer and die, and on the third day, rise again. Three parts of this passage that is our gospel this morning get my attention today. The disciples were afraid to hear this and they didn't ask about it. But Jesus asks, what were you talking about? And then Jesus places a child in their midst. So when Jesus articulates the road ahead telling that these terrible things will happen to him, the text says that The disciples don't understand and they're afraid to ask. Can imagine why. What will they do without Jesus, to whom they've committed their life for a few years now, for whom they have so many hopes? What will happen to them if they're close followers of Jesus? And you know, things come up and scare us just as much as the thought of Jesus' death scared them. We all have doomsday days thinking that we're all alone as things are coming apart around us or in us. So we worry, we could start the list, we worry about health, our health and the health of loved ones. We worry about money. We worry about the future of our church. We're apprehensive about the country, which is in such conflict over something which should be joyful and positive in election. AI might ruin us. Horror at things that are happening around the world. My heart breaks to hear about Israel and Palestine and Lebanon. I know yours does too and in the Sudan, and in other places. And I am always distressed about climate change and what's happening irreversibly, maybe, probably, to the planet we have to deal with. These things scare us. We don't understand them, and we're afraid to ask. We don't know how to talk about it. We don't know what to do to make these terrors, these problems in our lives stop. We don't know what to do to make peace or to help, we're not that powerful. We're more like nobodies, like Chicken Little, in the face of such big challenges. So it seems that the disciples try to handle their fear by talking about being somebodies instead of nobodies. They talk about who is the greatest. Now, I'm not sure if they're looking for a plan B or if they're just trying to distract themselves. Plan B would be, Now, if Jesus is arrested, maybe Peter can take over, or James. You read James' epistle today, and you know that he's very practical and has clear advice, right? Or maybe John, although John can be a little dreamy, or maybe Mary or Martha. Or if they're just looking to be distracted, maybe they're talking about who's the greatest baseball player who just got a game where he he brought in 10 RBIs while he 
walked three times and hit three homers or walked six times and whatever it was. Uh, or who's the number one um, gymnast in the world? Or who's the team that's going to win? Or, or I don't give a fig about that, but I know my multiplication tables better than you know yours. Or this person has the most money, so maybe they're the most powerful or, or whatever. Those kinds of 20, 25, 50 greatest lists. Yet when Jesus asks them what they were arguing about on the way, they're silent again. I wonder, this time it's probably not so much their fear as also mixed in with embarrassment and shame. But what's the alternative in a life where things, daily life and bigger things in life can just be overwhelming? Oh, Jesus says, you're worried about who is greatest. Let's not go there, Jesus says. Let's not consider the greatest, but let's think about the nobodies. Now, this has, after all, been the pattern of what Jesus has been doing with them month after month and day after day until now. His first healing was a man with an unclean spirit. His second, someone with leprosy. Then he healed another man with an unclean spirit, a woman with a hemorrhage, a dead child. And just before today's story in Mark chapter 9, he healed a boy that had a spirit whom his disciples had been unable to help. These actions of Jesus have one thing in common. God in Jesus is doing a new thing, and surprise of all surprises these miracles are done for people who are considered nobodies, not important, not the ones in power, but people who are discarded and have no other place to turn. Now, Jesus puts this, what he's been doing, into a teaching and into yet another demonstration for his disciples. Look how far we can push this, Jesus says. Bring me a child. For the child was the epitome of nobody in that culture. Unlike our culture where we prize children and we lift them up and we schedule our lives around their life schedules and so on, one in three children died in infancy in that culture, and the ones of who survived infancy, more than 60% never made it to adulthood. So children were kind of like disposable. You didn't know if they would live until they did live, and so you tried not, you loved them, but you tried not to take it too seriously so you wouldn't always be that heartbroken when they died. They were the most vulnerable. They had no rights. They were unimportant little nobodies with no status, loved but not cherished. And nobodies then in Jesus' culture, and how about in our culture? In our culture, one child in six lives in poverty. 11.4 million kids in this country, 2023 statistics. And in the world, 333 million children live in poverty. And in our culture and in our world, there are plenty of other different kinds of nobodies, people who are without housing, people who have diseases, people who have made a mess of things, people who are scary, people who we can go on and on with all the people that other people consider to be nobodies, nothing, not worth our time, not worth our energy or our effort. But Jesus says, welcoming such a nobody is how you welcome me, Jesus. In fact, welcoming such a nobody is how you welcome God. I didn't know that God needed a welcome. But God does long to be known among us as the lover of our souls, as our savior, as the peacemaker, as the one sent with a vision for the world, which is way different from how the world is living to a great extent. God needs a welcome. And we welcome God by turning to those right around us who often are invisible and serving them and lifting them up. You know, 
Jesus doesn't only reach out to nobodies. But on the cross, Jesus stretched out his arms of suffering and became a nobody. Betrayed, executed, dead, and buried. God raised that nobody, our leader and our inspiration, to be the one who reaches out to us nobodies and welcomes us in. Jesus stands with and joins all the nobodies in all times and places, stands with them, holds them, forgives them, promises them, promises us new life. Because here is another pattern of, in Mark's gospel and in our lives, how faith and fear are connected. Jesus said in the storm with his disciples, do not be afraid, have faith. And on the way to heal Jairus' daughter, Jesus told the father, do not fear, have faith. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is fear, to be afraid, at least the kind of fear that paralyzes and distorts and drives us to despair and sets us against one another in suspicion and hostility. So where we normally think of faith as a kind of a thing that God gives us or as an intellectual assent, yes, we agree with God, here in the Gospel of Mark and in our lives, faith is different. Faith, faith is like taking a step forward. It's like movement in spite of doubt and fear. It's about taking a step forward even though we're a nobody with other nobodies taking a step forward even though the sky is falling. Faith is doing even the smallest thing in the trust and hope of God's promises. We might say, faith is fortitude. Today in this meal, Jesus invites us nobodies to his table of love and mercy. Our empty hands are filled with the bread of his life and the cup of his salvation, and the hope of his future. And then, renewed by this meal of hope and mercy, Jesus invites us to arise and not be afraid. Jesus invites us to ask our questions, not just to panic like Chicken Little and and run in a panic, but to ask our questions, to look at how things are, even as the disciples in today's reading couldn't. Jesus invites us to go out in love stronger than fear and into the world of the skies falling around us and to walk with the nobodies in our lives and the nobodies in ourselves. Jesus invites us into faithful fortitude. Someone asked our founder in the 1500s, Martin Luther, what he would do if he knew that the world would end tomorrow. And you may have heard this story, Martin Luther said, if I knew that tomorrow was the end of the world, I would plant an apple tree today. If anyone asks us what we will do when the church is falling, the community is falling, the nation is falling, the world is falling, the planet is going to pieces, we may, in the fortitude of faith, say something like this. We know that whatever is going to pieces as we speak, we need not wait for greatness. No, we will find a child, a nobody, and welcome them right now. Welcome one another in Jesus' name.